Thank you very much for inviting me to Minsk. I'm sorry I don't speak Russian, so I shall speak to you in English, but a translation which Anna completed just in time will be <coughs> displayed on the screen for those who find a Russian text easier. And it would be grossly impertinent for me to talk to you about Soviet influences on scholarship, so this will be an hour without Marxism. <laughs> I wrote about problems in connection with the Athenian Assembly in the Festschrift for Igor Surikov, which was published earlier this year. So here I will briefly summarize my points about the Assembly and then go on to look at problems in connection with the Council. Knowing about the mechanisms is, of course, not all that we need to know about the Athenian democracy. But for a city whose mechanisms were well developed, as those of Athens were, knowing about the mechanisms and the opportunities and the limitations which they provided for the men active in politics is an important part of what we need to know. As Hansen has emphasized in an article in which he justifies his approach against the criticisms of scholars who think other kinds of question are more important. It seems now to be clear that arguments about demos, assembly, and law courts were more about language than about substance. The Athenians would not identify the courts with the demos because the word demos was so closely associated with the assembly, but we can regard both courts and assembly as embodiments of the polis. And although in a graphe paranomon, the courts could and sometimes did overrule a decree of the assembly, most decrees were not challenged, so on most matters, the assembly's decision was final. For the assembly's meeting place on the Pnyx, I am one of those who reject Plutarch's claim that the second phase, with its reversed orientation, was the work of the oligarchy of the 30, and I think it better attributed to the restored democracy. It's now, I think, certain that the third phase of the Pnyx was planned in the 340s and built in the 330s. It was never finished, perhaps because the theater of Dionysus, built about the same time, was found to be more convenient. To ratify grants of citizenship, a ballot with a quorum of 6,000 voters was introduced in the fourth century, and there is no evidence that that quorum was ever not obtained. So we can assume that 6,000 or more normally did attend the assembly. How many could attend on the Pnyx depends partly on how tightly Athenian citizens were willing to be packed, and that is a question on which Hansen and Stanton have disagreed. Payment for attending the assembly has commonly been seen as a device after the restoration of 403 to strengthen the assembly and the democracy. Gautier, in re-editing a decree on assembly pay from Eosus, thought the aim was punctual attendance. One explanation need not exclude the other, but after 403, I think numbers were more important than punctuality. On the frequency of meetings, I have upheld the traditional view that perhaps from before the Peloponnesian War, there were four regular meetings in each Brittany, each tenth of the year, and there could be additional meetings when needed. But Hansen has argued for only one regular meeting until the 350s, then three, 
and four regular meetings but no additional meetings from the 340s. The Athenaeon Politeia specifies particular items of business for particular assemblies out of the four regular assemblies of each Brittany. Hansen and I are agreed that those were requirements that particular items must be dealt with on the specified occasions and not that they must not be dealt with on other occasions. But Errington has taken the requirements to be restrictive that particular items could be dealt with only at the meetings for which they are specified and not at other meetings. That I find very hard to accept. The Athenaeon Politeia ends its survey of the Assembly's business with the frustrating remark, sometimes they transact business without a pro kerotonia. There are a few mentions of prokerotonia by orators, and a fragment from Lysias claims that when a probuluma was brought from the council to the assembly, a prokerotonia was used to decide whether it should be debated or simply accepted. Hansen has argued strongly in favor of an interpretation of that as a way of dealing with business efficiently. If the probuluma contained a specific recommendation, and not all probulumata did, then it would first be put to a prokeotonia, and if nobody voted against it, the probuluma would be accepted without debate. But if at least one man did vote against it, then the probuluma would have to be debated. That I now think is possible, but we don't have enough evidence to be certain. Two passages in Aeschines suggest that at one time, men over the age of 50 were invited to speak first in debates, but at some time between 345 and 330, this was abandoned. Hansen has accepted this but there is no good evidence of any occasion when that priority invitation to older citizens was issued, and I prefer the suggestion of Lane Fox that it was simply invented by Eskines. One question to which we still have no answer is how, in a meeting of about 6,000 men, a man who wanted to speak, particularly a man who was not a regular speaker, would attract the attention of the presiding officials and have himself called to the beamer so that he could speak. We have no evidence, but I know no text in which a man complains that he wanted to speak but could not. Presumably, the officials decided when to end a debate, and then a vote had to be taken. If the probuluma from the council made a specific recommendation, there would presumably be a vote on that. Amendments might be voted on individually, perhaps before the vote on the probuluma. If in the course of the debate, three or four different proposals were put forward by different speakers, presumably the officials had to decide what to do and there would not be a single vote with multiple options, but perhaps, as in the Senate at Rome, a series of proposals would be voted on until there was a majority in favor of one proposal. Hansen has argued successfully that when the citizens voted by show of hands, there was no attempt to make a precise count but there was simply an estimate of whether the majority was in favor or against. If the result was uncertain or was challenged, I suspect that a second vote was taken, and it was hoped that in the second vote there would be a clear majority. Meetings began early in the morning, and it has sometimes been thought that they lasted for the whole day, but Hansen has argued that commonly a meeting would end by midday. I now turn to the Council of 500, on which I wrote my own doctoral thesis. 
Here, too, there are interesting questions to which there is not yet a certain answer. First, there are questions about membership of the Council. The Athenaion Politeia tells us that there were 50 members from each of Athens' ten tribes. And in fact, in the Hellenistic period, when there were more than ten tribes, the size of the council was increased so that there should still be 50 members from each tribe. From the 4th century onwards, we have many inscriptions which list all the members of the council or all those from one tribe, and it is clear that there was a fixed number of members from the individual deems within the tribe, one member from small deems and several members from large deems. But there are only one or two such inscriptions from the 5th century. One is a list of the members from one tribe who made a dedication in 408-407, where it seems that there is not enough space for 50 members to have been listed, but only those who had joined in making the dedication were included. The other is perhaps a small part of a list of members of the whole council. The question inevitably arises, were the numbers of members from the different deems, which we know from the fourth century, the same as they had been since the institution of the council by Cleisthenes at the end of the sixth century? And although there is no direct evidence, indirect evidence suggests that the answer must be no, the numbers were not the same since the beginning as we know from the fourth century. Apart from the improbability that the relative population of the different deems would have remained the same for more than a century, there are some specific indications. Piraeus, the harbour town of Athens, in the fourth century had nine members, but it was not established as the harbour town until the early fifth century and it will have taken some time to grow to a size which justified nine members. Atene, near Sunium in the southeast of Attica, in the fourth century had three members, but archaeological exploration has shown that the area was still unoccupied at the end of the sixth century. In the fourth century, the members were appointed by lot and a citizen was allowed to serve in the council twice in his life, as an exception to the general rule that he could hold any particular civilian office only once, though of course he could hold different offices in different years. Had those rules applied since the establishment of the council by Cleisthenes? Here I think the answer should be possibly not though we cannot be certain. For the appointment of the Archons, a two-stage system of appointment by lot from a short list of elected candidates replaced a system of direct election in 487-6. The council was presumably being appointed by lot in the late 450s when Athens imposed a council appointed by lot on Erythrae one of the member states of the Delian League, but it is possible that originally the Athenian Council had been appointed by election. As for allowing men to serve twice in their lives, different Greek states used different rules to limit repetition without making it too difficult to find men who could be appointed. Drerus in 7th century Crete banned the appointment to the office of Cosmos within 10 years. For the council imposed by Athens on Erythrae, reappointment was banned within four years. In Athens, it is possible that allowing a man to serve twice was a concession needed in the fourth century when the number of citizens was only half of the number before the Peloponnesian War and that originally members had been allowed to serve only once in their lives. 
When I wrote the Athenian Boule, there was no evidence that anybody had served more than twice until the second century AD. But more recently, it has become clear that there were some men who served three times in the third century BC. Possibly the change was made when or soon after two additional tribes were created and the council was increased from 500 members to 600 members in 3076, which would make it harder to find enough members each year. It is often claimed that a man's two years of service in the council could not be consecutive years, and there is indeed no certain instance of a man who did serve in two consecutive years. But the argument that immediate reappointment would be prevented by the need to undergo euthunai, the accounting period at the end of a term of office, is not in itself a sufficient argument, since the generals, strategoi, like other officials, had to undergo euthunai, but they were frequently reappointed for the next year. There is a little evidence from the classical period that in addition to the 500 members, further men were appointed as epilachontes, substitutes, who would fill the vacancy if, for instance, one of the men originally appointed was rejected in his docimasia, the verification to which all men were subjected when they were appointed to any office in Athens. Thus, when Hyperbolus was appointed as a member for 421-420, a passage from the comedian Plato suggested that his epilacone was bound to become a member because Hyperbolus was bound to be disqualified. Some people have accepted it as a simple fact that a separate epilacone was appointed for each member, and therefore that each year a thousand men eligible to serve were appointed as members or as epilacontes. However, it is hard to believe that that actually happened and I have wondered if a smaller number of epilacontes was appointed, each of them acting as the potential substitute for several members, or if epilacontes were in fact appointed only when there were more candidates than those who needed to be appointed. Almost every Greek city had an assembly open to all qualified citizens and a smaller council which prepared the business to be dealt with by the assembly. An important question in Athens and in other cities was the relationship between the two bodies. Was the assembly the powerful body and the council its servant? Or was the council the powerful body and the power of the assembly much more limited? One approach to this question is to see how much business and what kinds of business the assembly dealt with. And in Athens, it is clear from inscribed decrees and from other evidence that the assembly met frequently and decided a great deal of business, small matters as well as large. The council did have some power to make decisions of its own but these were decisions on subsidiary matters, and there are some decrees of the assembly which explicitly authorize the council to make supplementary decisions as long as these do not conflict with the decisions of the assembly. Particularly from the fourth century onwards, the Athenians in the texts of their decrees used languages which enables us to distinguish between two types of decree enacted by the assembly. Decrees where the assembly decided to accept a proposal put to it in the council's probuluma, and decrees where it did not do that, either because there was not a specific proposal in the probuluma, or because there was a specific proposal in the probuluma, but the assembly decided something different. 
In the Athenian boule, I, I studied the two types of decree, and I concluded that until the end of the Cremonidian War in 263-2, decrees of both kinds are plentiful, which suggests that both the council and the assembly played an active part in Athens' decision-making. But after that, it seems to have been a matter of convention that decrees recommending that one of the prytanies of the council should be honoured were not proposed in the pro Luma, but otherwise almost all decrees of the assembly did accept a proposal in the pro Luma, which suggests that the assembly no longer played an active part in the process. Applying this kind of analysis on a smaller scale to a short period is more hazardous because the number of surviving decrees which can be reliably dated is smaller. But the attempt has sometimes been made and as the body of material increases, the attempt becomes more worthwhile. Oliver has remarked that in the oligarchic period 322-1 to 319-18, when we might expect a more powerful council and a weaker assembly, it seems to have been the council which was weakened and a majority of the assembly's decrees did not accept a proposal from the council. Earlier in the fourth century, while I had found that in the whole period of the restored democracy, 4032 to 322 1, inscribed decrees were about equally divided between the two types. Lambert has noted that in the later part of this period, from 352 1 onwards, a majority of the inscribed decrees were again of the type in which the assembly did not accept a proposal from the council and those in which it did accept a proposal from the council were mostly honorific decrees of a kind which were not likely to be controversial. So what Oliver noticed in the oligarchic period from 321 to 318 was not so much an unexpected weakening of the council, but the continuation of a practice which had prevailed in the previous 30 years of the democracy. The council, owing to the way in which it was recruited from the members of the deems, was a cross-section of the citizen body which changed every year, while the assembly, in which the most influential citizens could remain active year after year, was the body in which serious matters and matters on which there might be disagreement were decided. By contrast, Lambert found that between 229.8 and 198.7, after Athens had escaped from dependence on the Antigonids of Macedon, just as I had found earlier, it was much more frequent for the assembly to accept proposals from the council, and the council was much more important and the assembly less important in the decision-making process. Another question about the council concerns the Tritius, the third of the Prytanes. The Athenaeon Politeia tells us that the Epistates of the Prytanes, the chairman for the day, remained on duty in the Tholos, the headquarters of the Prytanes, for the whole 24 hours during which he was chairman, and with him a Tritius of the Prytanes ordered by him. But what was a tritius of the Prytanes? If it was an approximation to a mathematical third, it cannot have been an exact third, because neither 50 nor 49, if we exclude the epistates, can be divided by three. Except in this passage, the only context in which we encounter trituers in Athens is the trituers of the tribes. Each of the ten tribes instituted by Cleisthenes was divided into three trituers, one located in the city region of Attica, one in the coastal region, and one in the inland region. 
and the most obvious interpretation is that the Athenaeon Politeia means the Prytanes from one of those trituaries. But we know from the membership of the council in the fourth century and later that although each of the tribes supplied 50 members, the trituaries, like the individual deems, were not at all equal in size. In some tribes, the arrangement of fourth century lists of members of the council has shown signs of a pattern which might reflect a more equal division of the tribe's 50 members of the council into three groups. And some people have seen here a tritus of the Pritanes, different from the trituers of the tribes. This is a view with which I used to have some sympathy but there is not enough regularity in the inscriptions to make a strong case for it. Hansen has suggested that we have here a sign of the revision of the council's membership in the 4th century, that in the original scheme of Cleisthenes, the trituers of the tribes were approximately equal, and that in the revision of the 4th century, some deems located in the coastal or inland region were reassigned to a city tritus in order to preserve that equality. Here, I think we can only guess. While it is likely that the numbers of members of the council from individual deems were different at first from the numbers in the 4th century, we cannot estimate what the original numbers may have been, and I doubt whether deems were reassigned to different trituers for the sake of equality. I now think it likely that a tritus of the Pritanes means simply the, tritu the Pritanes from one of the three regional trituers into which the tribes were divided, and I agree with Eliot that if that was sometimes more than a third and sometimes less than a third, it did not matter. Chambers suggests that the Epistates would normally call on the members from the Tritus to which he himself belonged to stay on duty with him. The Athenaeon Politeia claims that in the past, the council as a law court had unlimited power to impose penalties including even the death penalty. But after an episode in which one man insisted on a trial in a law court for a man whom the council had condemned to death, the assembly decided that penalties which the council wanted to impose must be confirmed in a court. We know from other evidence that in the fourth century, the council could still impose fines up to a limit of 500 drachmae as individual officials could impose fines up to a lower limit in matters which, with which they were concerned. And probably this was an absolute right, and those fines were not subject to appeal. Also, the council could in some circumstances have men imprisoned, not as a punishment, but as a precaution to prevent them from absconding before they were brought to trial or had paid a penalty. But when did it have the unlimited right which the Athenaeon Politeia claims for the past? The Athenaeon Politeia, in connection with the last of its 11 changes in the constitution, states, for also the judgments of the council have come to the demos. And some scholars, including Clochet, suppose that to mean that the council did not lose its unlimited powers until the fourth century. But the evidence does not support the view that the council's powers were unlimited in the late 5th century, and it is better to read that statement as a comment not on the 11th change, but on the whole development of the Athenian constitution from the beginning to the 11th change. It's hard to believe that Solon's council of 400 in the 6th century had that power. Some people have thought that Cleisthenes Council of 500 was a powerful body when it was first created, but its power was reduced only a few years later when its oath of office was instituted in 501-500.
but I think that the oath of office is better interpreted as the culmination of Cleisthenes' reform rather than as a significant modification of it. I am not convinced that the council had any powers of punishment before powers were taken from the Areopagus by Ephialtes in 462.1, and I believe that the powers which it was given then were limited from the beginning. So the council never had the unlimited powers which are said to have been taken away from it, but ancient Greeks may have concluded, as some modern scholars have concluded, from clauses in the members' oath undertaking not to do certain things, that until the oath was imposed, the council had done those things. And the story of the man saved from execution is either a story originally told in connection with the Areopagus, or a total invention which has been used to, under, to explain the undertaking in the member's oath. A little later, questions arise about what the correct text of the Athenaeum Politeia should be. The council takes care of the triremes which have been built, the equipment and the ship sheds, and it builds new triremes or quadriremes, whatever the demos votes. The Greek text says poietai kainas de trieres e tetreres. The de in that position is certainly wrong, but should it simply be deleted, or is it a corruption of some other word? Perhaps a numeral, meaning that the council was committed to building that number of new ships each year. On the basis of the different numeral systems used by the Greeks at different times, either four or ten could have been corrupted to de. Certainly the requirement to have new ships built was taken seriously, and Androtian, when he proposed that the council in which he had served in probably 356-5, should be honoured although it had not satisfied the shipbuilding requirement, was prosecuted in a graphe paranomone, apparently unsuccessfully. But neither Demosthenes' speech for that prosecution, nor any of the ancient commentaries on it, claims that there was a regular number of ships which had to be built year after year. At the time when the Athenaeum Politeia was written, in the 330s, 320s, Athens' navy was being modernised and enlarged, but the inscriptions listing ships don't suggest that there was a regular number of ships which had to be built each year. Shipbuilding programmes have been discussed by Blackman, who suggests that there were regular shipbuilding quotas at different times, but doubts whether the Athenaeum Politeia had a number in the text here. I think, and Chambers in the most recent Teubner text thinks, that here we should simply delete de and not restore a number. A later chapter deals with various dokimasii, verification processes in which the council was involved. Together with these, we are told, the council used to judge the paradigmata and the peplos, but now it is done by a law court picked by sortition, since it was thought that the councillors were using favouritism in their judgement. The peplos was the new robe made for the cult statue of Athena and taken in procession at the great Panathenaia every four years. But what is meant here by paradigmata? The word can denote models or plans for buildings, sculptures, paintings, or other works of skill. And most commentators have taken the reference here to be plans for public works in general. Some, however, have linked the paradigmata with the peplos and have supposed the passage to mean that the council approved the design for the new peplos on each occasion. 
and Blass emended the text. Blass was a great emender of texts. Blass emended the text to express that meaning more clearly. There's no other relevant evidence, and this is a difficult matter to decide. Originally, I favoured the first interpretation, plans for public works in general, but in my editions of the Athenaeum Politeia, I have preferred the reference to the peplos, though without emending the text, and Chambers in his commentary takes the same position. In other respects, this is one of the passages in the Athenaeum Politeia which are frustratingly brief. We should like to know when this duty was transferred from the council to a court, and whether that was a single reform or was part of a set of reforms. And in the new system, we should like to know which officials were responsible for bringing the matter to a law court. For the transfer from the council to a court, we can only guess. However, there is a later passage which states that many of the officials in Athens who were appointed by lot, some used to be appointed from the tribes along with the archons, but others were distributed among the deems. But it was found that the deems were selling their offices and so most of these were transferred to the whole tribe. This is a reform of the same kind as the transfer of decisions about the peplos from the council to a law court, because the council was showing favouritism. It would make sense if the two transfers were made at the same time, though of course it is not necessary that they should have been made at the same time. And the transfer of appointments can at least be dated before about 370, because then a system of appointments using allotment machines, Cleroteria, was introduced, which was based on the tribes and not on the deems. As for the officials who brought these matters to a court, a later passage tells us that in the time of the Athenaeum Politeia, there were specific officials known as Athlothotai who served not for one year but for four, so that each board was in charge of one celebration of the great Panathenaea. Their responsibilities included the procession in which the new peplos was carried to the Acropolis. And we are explicitly told that they have the peplos made. The work Making it was done by women referred to as ergastini and upper-class girls aged between 7 and 11, known as arephoroi, were involved with it in some way. But the athlothotai presumably had overall responsibility. Once they had acquired that responsibility, their name suggests that they were originally responsible only for the contests, they would be the obvious officials to bring the choice of design for the peplos to a law court. So the Athenian democracy is a fascinating phenomenon and one on which we have a good deal of evidence. It can be studied in various ways. Studying the formal institutions is one worthwhile way. And as I've shown with regard to the assembly and the council, there are still questions to which we should like to have answers, but have not yet obtained answers about which we can be certain. Thank you. Spasibo. What interested me was uh, that question of how people who were going to speak uh, could get to the stand. You said that uh, there is no clarity as to how uh, people in charge of the assembly could notice them. Uh, is it possible that uh, it was not uh, a problem at all if uh, the uh, totality is only 6,000 uh, people? Uh, well, it's not so much, so they could just make their way to the stand uh, without any problems if they uh, were eager to speak. And even, uh, even a greater, uh, so to say, assembly of 15,000 people, well, we can just check it with, so to say, modern meetings in the center of our cities and to assess uh, if uh, there is a great 
uh, if uh, such uh, amount of people, uh, it will take a great, so to say, uh, place, space, and so on. Maybe that was not problem at all. I have no experience myself of meetings attended by 6,000 people or more. I don't think there would be a problem with regular speakers. The regular politicians would probably speak to one of the presiding officials before the meeting started and uh, say, I want to speak on this subject and you will find me sitting in my usual place over there. But for someone who speaks in the assembly only occasionally, to stand up and get himself called to the platform in a meeting of 6,000 men. It, it must have happened, but I myself cannot understand it. In a crowded meeting like that, you, you're, 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 some, you're somewhere up, up there, back right, and you simply start walking forward. Maybe. But perhaps, perhaps you have experience of such mass meetings, which I do not, which I do not have. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, yes. Давайте я кратко перескажу эту дискуссию. Вопрос о том, что во время народного собрания, когда присутствуют одновременно 6 тысяч граждан, довольно сложно человеку, который обычно не выступает с какими-то замечаниями, как-то привлечь к себе внимание организаторов, так сказать, и пробиться к собственно, возвышению, с которого он мог бы выступить. Но Иван Андреевич сравнил это с современным нашим политическим опытом. Да, и... Ну, предположил, что, возможно, это и вовсе не было проблемой, потому что, в принципе, при желании можно ну, не так сложно дойти до места выступления и забраться туда. Вот, на что Питер ответил, что у него опыта нету, и сам он не может судить. Одно дело, когда э, это касается ну, политиков, которые привыкли выступать в народных собраниях, которые могут заранее подойти к должностным лицам и сказать им, что вот, я ваш старый добрый знакомый, я буду выступать, поэтому, пожалуйста, в нужный момент позовите меня, буду сидеть в привычном месте. Но такое действие кажется Питеру совершенно невозможным для человека, который не выступает или выступает очень редко. Поэтому вот здесь, конечно, вопрос скорее упирается в разный опыт. Можем мы что-то представить или нет? Я, кстати, не могу представить, как можно выступать без микрофона, потому что это нужно э, очень сильный голос, чтобы привлечь внимание. И мой опыт подсказывает в этом амфитеатре у Покровских ворот э, лекция. Это там только с микрофоном, иначе ничего не слышно абсолютно. Rather than the Pnix, and by luck or by skill, the Greeks had discovered how to build an auditorium 
in which a man can make himself heard. С помощью правильного выбора места проведения народного собрания, потому что сначала это был Пникс, а затем собрание перенесли в театр Диониса и так вышло или случайно, или все-таки осознанно, что греки э, узнали, как строить помещение так, чтобы в них была очень хорошая слышимость. Ну, пожалуйста, еще. Питер, спасибо вам большое за очень интересную презентацию. Могу я спросить, когда вы думаете, что Ассенин демократия начала с того, с какой эпохой вы можете соединиться? Я имею в виду реформы Соло или Клайсенес, или это был процесс степ-бай-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ-степ
on the Acropolis and it became the robe of the cult statue for the next four years. So the peplos, the, the, this is religious, but it is also national. The peplos is an important element in the Athenians' identity. Значит, эм, вопрос был, почему э, Питер привел в своем выступлении пример с значит, пеплосом для статуи Афины, почему это было вообще так важно. Значит, э, пример появился просто ну, как э, э, еще одно явление, о котором мы не знаем, потому что ну, мы не знаем, э, как взаимодействовать как относятся к друг другу слова «пеплос» и «парадейгмата» в этом э, отрывке, и э, идет ли там речь о каких-то э, проектах общественных работ, или там обсуждается именно вот проект, там, дизайн этого «пеплоса». Вот, это э, просто было приведено в докладе для примера. А сам «пеплос», конечно, играл э, очень важную роль именно в э, самоидентификации «Афинин», то есть… Э, это было важно для э, религиозной сферы и для их самосознания, потому что это были все-таки панафинеи, главный праздник, и этот пеплос э, дарили ну, статуи богини, которая, в общем-то, э, была покровительницей города, и сама эта процессия занимала в жизни Афинян очень э, важное место. Питер, у меня два вопроса. First, uh, uh, was uh, the Athenian boule uh, the biggest one among Greek polis? Or we do not know about it. Я переведу. Был ли Афинский совет 500 самым большим, самым среди других нугенческих полис? I think by, by the Hellenistic period, when it was larger, than the 500, it certainly was the largest. Did Ma I am struggling with my memory. Did Massilia have a council of 600? Um, oligarchic states would have a much smaller council. The Gerousia of 30 in Sparta, a council of 80 in Corinth. But you would, to have as large a council as 500, you would need to be democratic and you would also need to be a large city. And not many Greek cities were as large as Athens. Thank you very much. Uh, uh я спросил о величине ну, Совета, и ну, Питер ответил, что э, в эллинистическое время, ну, возможно, были больше, в классическое время, может, в Мессении, может быть, но, но он не помнит, я ну, ну, тоже по правде 600, но, но это проверять нужно. Но вообще ну, Афинский был ну, самым большим, потому что в олигархических были меньше, э, ну, город большой, ну, Афины... That's the point. Uh, and uh, no, another question, a uh, historiographic one. Uh, uh, was the, disc, uh, the celebration and 2,000 and 500 anniversary of democracy in the uh, early 90s uh, uh, influence much to um, studies uh, on democracy and uh, understanding on the date of the beginning of uh, democracy? Yes. Uh, who, whoever it was that first decided to celebrate 2,000 years clearly had an interest in emphasizing Cleisthenes. I don't think that there was ever a comparable celebration of 2,000 years after Solon, 2,500 years after Solon. There is still time, I shall be dead, but some of you will still be alive, there is still time to celebrate 2,500 years after Ephialtes. <laughs> Uh, 
Проверяла ли празднование двух с половиной тысячелетней годовщины демократии, которая в 90-е годы ну, раскручивалась и в США, и в Европе, и в Греции, ну как-то на, так сказать, на исторические исследования. Ну, ну, Питер ответил, что скорее нет, и может быть, доживем ли мы до ну, ну, празднования двух с половиной тысячелетней годовщины демократии от Эфиальта, а не от Перикла, мы не знаем. Ну, в любом случае, годовщину стоит использовать, наверное. Спасибо, еще вопрос. recognized three functions, deliberation, making decisions, administration, and justice. But they did not believe in the separation of powers as Montesquieu was later to believe. We in the modern world are afraid of powerful governments, and we, we think it particularly important that the law courts should be independent of the government so that even the government is obliged to obey the law. The problem in the ancient world was not powerful government, but weak government, and it was not seen as a problem that the assembly and the council should also have judicial power to reinforce their other powers. So essentially, the Greeks recognize Montesquieu's three functions, but they don't believe, as Montesquieu did, in a separation of powers. Я просил чуть-чуть uh, больше прокомментировать uh, относительно uh, юридических uh, полномочий uh, Совета и uh, Народного Собрания. Да, ну и, и в ответе прозвучало, что наше представление о разделении судебной, uh, исполнительной и законодательной uh, власти не uh, совсем совпадает с uh, греческим представлением uh, об этом, идущее от... Uh, Монтескье, и э, что проблемой для Греции была не слишком э, сильная исполнительная власть, а слишком слабая исполнительная власть, и, соответственно, э, угрозы э, в расширении, придании судебных полномочий э, исполнительной власти, как в случае с Советом Народного Собрания, э, э, это не воспринималось как угроза, да, как угроза демократии. Вот. Ну, это, так сказать... As you think, uh, Athenian democracy is a, a general line of uh, evolution of uh, human societies, uh, which uh, evolved in modern world, or deviation of this general line from Eastern despotis and so on. As far as we know, the idea of democracy began with the Greeks. There, uh, there were other small city-states in other parts of the ancient world, but as far as we know, the idea of democracy and theorizing about democracy began with the Greeks. That ultimately came to an end with the Roman Empire. And there was then a new development in Europe from absolute monarchy towards limited monarchy and republicanism. And for a long time, even Europeans who were opposed to monarchy 
distrusted democracy, which they saw as the rule of the mob, and they preferred a Roman kind of republicanism to an Athenian kind of democracy. I, there was some approval for democracy among some of the men involved in the French Revolution. Otherwise, in Britain, democracy first became a favorable term rather than an unfavorable term in the 1820s with men such as Grote. And of course, modern representative democracy is not the same kind of thing as the direct democracy of an ancient city-state. Вопрос касался сути афинской демократии, что это такое закономерный, закономерный этап развития или отклонения. И, в общем, как ответил Питер, афинская демократия, ну и вообще демократия, это явление, характерно исключительно для Древней Греции, придуманной древними греками и закончившейся с началом римского времени. Вот. И, в общем-то, потом на долгое время забытое. Даже в э, истории, когда э, искали альтернативы монархии, э, демократия считалась скорее негативным явлением, э, поскольку ассоциировалась с властью толпы и больше симпатии вызывала римское республиканское устройство, например. Вот э, первые... Э, Идеи о том, что демократия не так уж и плохо, появились, с одной стороны, у некоторых участников французской революции, а с другой стороны, вот в Британии, например, это произошло только в 1820-е годы. И, конечно, надо помнить, что со средних веков наше политическое устройство прошло совершенно другой путь развития абсолютной монархии к конституционной и к республике, но та представительская демократия, которая у нас есть сейчас, это совершенно не то же самое, что прямая демократия, которая была в Древней Греции. С политической, скажем, точки зрения, когда другие общества говорят, что мы не должны следовать демократии, потому что вообще традиционное нормальное состояние общества это демократия, монархия. Все, что было в Греции, в Риме и сейчас на Западе, вот это неправильно. Понял? Да, речь. Сейчас. But uh, there is also um, one point of view, uh, um, which says that the uh, right uh, way of political uh, Right, right political system is uh, the tyranny or um, Eastern monarchy, but all the ideas of uh, Greek democracy, of uh, Roman Republic and our uh, current European tradition, they are wrong in, in their core. Plato thought that the best people to rule are the best people who have the best knowledge and the best ability. Aristotle thought that if such an ideal person could be found, he would be the best ruler. But since such an ideal person cannot be found, it is better to have some kind of constitutional government. And Among the Greeks in general, it was agreed that constitutional government and government according to law was best, but there was disagreement as to whether you should have what the Greeks called arithmetical democracy, giving the same rights to each individual, or proportional equality, giving more rights to those who deserved 
more rights. And the Romans, after the Greeks, were on the side of proportional equality with a hierarchical system rather than an egalitarian system. As I said before, essentially this all came to an end and Europe set out on a fresh development after the end of the Roman Empire from absolute monarchy to limited monarchy or republicanism. But um, from your point of view, can we even speak about the, the right way of evolution of political system, or we just have to admit that there are many ways or, and many types? It is, no, no. It is clear in the world in which we live that different people have different views on the right way to govern a state. One thing which has changed in the world in which we live is that almost all regimes have adopted the word democracy, although they mean different things by democracy. And until the 19th century, at least, there were those who would say democracy was good and those who would say democracy was bad. Now, every regime, almost every regime, calls itself a democracy, but it must be our kind of democracy and not another kind of democracy. So, if, if you like, the language has been corrupted. Thank you very much. <laughs>